Okay, hello and welcome everybody. Uh, let me just check that my screen is being shared properly. Great. Um, good morning and welcome to our design visualization for events and live entertainment webinar. My name is Mark Richards and I'm marketing manager for Digistore. Digistore is Australia's gold media and entertainment partner for Autodesk. I want to thank you for your time today and taking time out of your schedules to join us for the webinar. We do intend to record this webinar, so if everything goes to plan, we'll be sending the link to the recording at the end and provide Digistore's contact details in case there's anything else um, we can assist you with. We'll be streaming so um, on Digistore's Facebook page. So. Um, uh, feel free to invite people to watch the webinar there if they haven't joined um, now and um, that will also be available uh, as a post directly on our Facebook page at the end of the event. Um, what I want to do now is um, give you a quick overview of the agenda. So um, let's just um, start with that. Um, Initially, we'll um, do a quick introduction, and that's me, Mark Richards, giving that introduction. Um, then I'll pass over to Dave Zed for a um, 3D Studio Max 2018 update. Um, Dave, um, it's great to have Dave with us today. Welcome, David. You should be able to say hello, Dave. Thanks, Mark. It's really good to be here. And I just want to say thank you for organizing this, Mark. It's, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to today. Uh, that's a pleasure. Um, Dave has an impressive depth of knowledge, not only in the Autodesk animation product suite of features and capabilities, but also in the Australian and New Zealand market and how these capabilities can be applied in the real world. I'm also pleased to be able to introduce Jonathan Yeo from Yeo Creative Services. Good morning, Jonathan. Good morning. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, Jonathan's an experienced 3D visualizer and live entertainment production manager. His company, Yo Creative Solutions, supports all stages of the creative process for design visualization, especially around events and live productions. He's very kindly offered to share his pipeline and insights with us today. There's a lot to cover um, today, uh, but hopefully at the end of the uh, webinar, we'll have time for Q&A. So please submit your questions during the presentation as you think of them via the webinar Q&A panel. So you'll see a Q&A button in your Zoom um, uh, interface there. Make sure you enter the questions by um, pressing that Q&A button rather than chat. We'll answer them during the Q&A session at the end. All questions are gratefully received. Um, it's often the case that if a question occurred to you, many others will want to know the answer too. So please don't hesitate to submit your questions as we go along. This is your opportunity to uh, make the most of David and Jonathan while they're online. Um, if we don't get to any of the questions during the Q&A, they'll be recorded and we'll make sure we'll respond to you directly after the webinar has ended. If you want to know more after the webinar, where do you go? Um, I wanted to make sure I provided Digistore's contact details for you today so you can easily get in touch with us. If there's anything you need for us to follow up for you after the webinar, here are the main contact details. And of course, you can use the Contact Us page on our website. Don't hesitate to get in touch. You can see by the picture how eagerly our staff is waiting by the phone for your call. So um, get in touch. Which one are you, Mark, in that picture? Yeah, secret. <laughs> who is Digital Digistore? Uh, for those who aren't familiar with us, this is a single sentence describing what we do. But specific, more specifically to this webinar, our specialization is the integration of Autodesk and other products into animation, VFX, visualization, gaming, and other solutions so our customers can produce great content with confidence. Australia's leading post houses, visual effects companies, game studios and architects are Digistore customers, so we can bring our experience to bear to solve your application requirements. If you're not familiar with it, V-Ray is the um, preeminent render engine for 3D Studio Max. It comes with all the lighting, shading and rendering tools you need to create professional photo real imagery and animation and has seamless integration with 3D Studio Max. For the webinar specifically, Digistore is offering 20% off 
the new V-Ray 3.6 for Max for all those that registered and attended the webinar. The offer appear, uh, applies to commercial versions of 3D Studio Max and is valid for the webinar attendees and their organizations for purchases from Digistore on or before the 13th of September. So that's for two weeks only. So if you're interested in taking advantage of that, um, get in touch with us um, as soon as you can. Um, the offer applies to perpetual monthly and annual subscription options. Um, just give us a call if you've got any questions. Okay, I'd like to pass over to David. Um, and um, uh, so we're going to swap screens now. So bear with us while I hand over to David from Autodesk. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. So um, uh, I'm the animation specialist for Meta Entertainment uh, at Autodesk. And today what I want to do is mainly just focus on 3 Studio Max. There's quite a lot of new things that have come out in 2018. Uh, I do cover all the other 3D programs like Maya and Motion Builder, Mudbox, all of those sort of things. But I figured, you know, there's so much happening in Max. So let's just focus on that. I am also going to touch on um, uh, Stingray a little bit, um, but basically I've broken this presentation up into three sort of three sort of bits: announcement, connectivity, and features. So I'd say one of the biggest announcements we've got right now uh, with Max and, and across the M and E uh, suite of software is that uh, Mental Ray no longer ships with with the three D the M and E three D software. So what we've got now is we've got Arnold is our new uh, renderer that uh, ships with Max, uh, with Maya, um, and it's quite, quite, uh, I've been having so much fun with it, but yeah, it's, it's a fantastic renderer. The other announcement is um, we've bundled Stingray with Max, and as of, I think, last month, we've got uh, 3D Studio Max Interactive. So if you've got a Max license, you've got access to Max Interactive. So have a look at that and um, have a play with that. Not, some of the stuff I'm going to be showing today uh, relates to Stingray and Max Interactive. Uh, so connectivity. Uh, we've really worked a lot with um, 3D Studio Max's library and the creative market. Uh, so we've got, we've got a few tool sets that in, uh, integrate that, I guess you could say, a little bit better and make that, that workflow a lot easier for you. Um, so you can see here, uh, we've got the, the asset library. Now, the, the asset library has sort of been around for a while, but it's needed uh, an overhaul for a good couple of years, and we've done that quite extensively. So you can see this is what you'll be presented with when you go to the asset library, um, and it's customizable as well uh, to, to a degree. Um, so I've got a video here just quickly showing, I've, I've sped it up a bit, just quickly showing um, uh, the ease of using the asset library. So right now I've got a custom asset here uh, that I'm bringing in, some of our Hyperspace Madness assets. Um, and then I was just attaching that to a, a, a positioning node. We can see here I'm quickly going through, and these are some of the presets you can get from uh, Creative Market. So you've got all sorts of textures, all sorts of geometry, you know, heaps of stuff. Now what I've done here is I've I've sort of focused my search in the asset library for hyperspace madness assets specifically. And more specific, excuse me, Sven, who is one of the characters in hyperspace madness. So you can see here I've got my hyperspace madness folder, got that selected. Uh, and then what I'm doing now is I want to um, select, uh, and I can select by um, uh, image, uh, name, I can even add tab, uh, like tabs to it. So like, like when you're doing, say, YouTube searches and stuff like that. So here I've, I've typed in Sven, I've typed in High Space Madness, and now what it'll do is it'll present me all the assets that have Sven or Hyperspace Madness attached to those assets. So what I'm doing here is just going through, just grabbing a, a JPEG, um, and, and then just changing that, removing that, sorry, adding that to my list. And you can see that it's easy to select. 
The other thing that's good with this is we can select by polygon count. So what I've done is I've typed in 100 polys and now it's only bringing up assets that are 100, typed in 1,000, 10,000, a million, and so on. So what's great about that is that, you know, if, I, if I'm only wanting to work with real, real small LEDs, then all I have to worry about is, say, typing in uh, 10,000, and only poly so only assets with ten thousand polys will actually come up. Um, so the other thing too with connectivity is we've got uh, like a live linking that you can do, and this is something we've had for at least a year or two. But again, you know, we've just been working on making this more seamless and making this uh, more uh, easier for you. So you can see here, I'm going through uh, in Max, just uh, mucking around. And then I'm going to go and select my Stingray tab and then hit Live Link. You can see here on the left, I've got Stingray. On the right, I've got Maps. And then I'm just hitting the Send To. So I'm sending the whole level from Maps into Stingray. And if you have a look down the bottom, uh, oh, the, the taskbar's gone, but it moves pretty quickly through there. So you can see now I've got um, uh, Stingray on the, on the left, Max on the right, and I'm moving the camera in Stingray, and I'm getting that uh, real-time feedback in the viewport in Free Studio Max. So the game exporter, uh, what I've got here is a video just showing setting up an animation set. Um, very simple animation. Basically, what I've got is just a, a sliding door. So this is for so architectural visual, visualization. And I'm setting it up so it'll it'll it takes 100 frames to open and then 100 frames to close, basically. I've then exported that out as an animation set. Put that into my door folder, and then um, it's playing a little bit slow. Sorry about that. Uh, just setting up the paths for all of all of that. And then once I drop it in here, make sure that I've got animation selected. So it creates a new animation folder, brings in all the animations for me. Uh, stop playing. Let me just play that again. Okay. Um, and you can see here down the bottom uh, right, so right of the screen, as I play through, I can see the animation of what my door is going to do. So it tells me what my door is going to do. Now what I need to do is um, create a, a Lua script for that to work and an animation um, trigger for that to work as well. So I'm setting up my level editor for that animation to play. And it looks like the video has just stopped again. I apologize about that. There we go. <coughs> so here I am just setting it up. Now, what I love about using the, the scripting in, in Stingray is it's all color coded, so it's super easy. Uh, I'm just creating a, um, uh, a container. So that yellow box is container. If the player walks into it, that's going to be my triggering device to actually trigger the animation. Um, I don't know why this animation but this keeps stopping. And now I'm just going to play do a, a quick test play um, of the level. <laughs> Video stopped again. And you can see now this is in Stingray. As I walk up to it, the door opens. As I walk away from it, the door closes. Video stops again. But you get the idea. There we go. All right. Okay, one of the other features is is new blend box mapping. Uh, and I've got a quick video here just demonstrating that process as well. So th th this, this is a really powerful tool um, and a lot of fun to work with. So anyone that's uh, familiar with, say, ramp shaders and that sort of stuff may see some similarities here. 
Uh, but you can see here, we can uh, blend the edges of our, our textures on this geometry. And get some really nice looks really, really quickly. Um, Mark, I might get you to put yourself on mute or, or Jonathan, I can hear someone. Sorry, that might be me, I'm tapping away. That's okay. Um, okay, so uh, what, what we've got here is some um, uh, new features in um, sort of data channel settings, which allow for like um, smoothing groups, uh, re really sort of nice looks. Uh, the other thing too that we can do here with this is set up for um, like motion graphics stuff. So you can see here I've got basically a few little um, uh, nodes that are driving these, these animations here. And as I drag that around, I get a really nice kind of, just a nice little motion graphics-y sort of thing going on. Now uh, here I am playing with the, the ramp shader um, or the fall-offs, I should say, on, on the texture there. And this is a nice one too. This was just mucking around with what you can do with it. Um, and you can see here I'm getting like a really nice uh, kind of like um, mud look. Uh, this here is a fall-off, so we're getting like an embossed, uh, an object that's creating an emboss uh, look that's animated on uh, another object, and here another motion graphics thing that's being driven by uh, the, sh the the um, the uh, uh, point node. Okay, so chamfer improvements. Um, so all the beveling and chamfering. There's been work that's been done on the algorithms to make them work a lot better. So you can see here, I've got the old way that it would chamfer, uh, and I'm bringing in the new algorithm, and you can see that it just does a much better job of those really awkward sort of areas, like this funny corner that I'm focusing on here. Uh, in the past, that would be a real hassle to get that to look nice and smooth like that. You'd probably bevel it uh, and then have to go in, delete all the offending faces and and fix it up manually. Okay. This one, as a, as a character animator, this is something that's close to my heart, motion paths. So we've had this feature in Maya for a good couple of years now. Uh, we've now got this in Max. So what we're doing here is um, we've got a motion path that shows the motion that this character follows. So unlike animating on a spline, this, this is not animating on a spline. It looks like a spline, and we can edit it just like a spline. But this is a motion path. So we can edit that animation of that character by either selecting the points on the motion path or selecting the bones that that motion path is is uh, is showing. Okay, so workspace. Um, what we've done with the workspace is uh, we've made it more, um, you know, you can move stuff around. Uh, everything's dockable now, which you know, you can argue is a good thing and a bad thing. Um, I personally, you know, I've, I've got my my preferred way of working. Uh, but what's great about this is you're not restricted to the way that uh, Max comes out of the box. Now you can set up your workspace exactly how you want it, and you can set up your workspace for if you're doing modeling or if you're doing animation or texturing. So exactly what you're actually doing, the type of work you're doing, you can set up your workspace to be more ergonomic for you. Uh, set, uh, scene states and state sets, we've done some work on as well. Uh, these are great, if you haven't used them, they're a great way of managing your scenes. Uh, you can see here I've set it up, um, just going up here, setting it up for the objects that are on the table so that you can hide those objects and unhide those objects. You can see here just a, a quick example of that. <coughs> um, and then going down here, I'm going to set it up uh, for um, like the AO pass so that 
Once I select that, I'll, when I hit the render, I only get an AO pass coming out. So you can see here is my beauty pass, looks good. Uh, now I select the AO button, and then I hit the render button, and then I get an AO straight away out of that. So it's just a nice way of managing your scenes. Okay, MCG. You know, there's a, a ton of work that's been done on the MCG. Uh, every year there's, it, there's a lot of stuff that's been done with it. What's great about it is um, it's really been driven by studios. As you can see here, this is some work that's come from some studios. Uh, MCG is a very, very powerful tool. Um, it's good for motion graphics, but uh, you know that's kind of just the tip of the iceberg of what the MCG can do. Like basically, it allows you to write your own tools to work inside of Max. So you can see here we've got some examples of things that you can do. Uh, and as I was saying, uh, this year Arnold ships with, with 3D Studio Max. Um, and that's me. I did have a video I wanted to show you, a showreel of some of the Arnold, some of the projects we've done with Arnold, but unfortunately the frame rate is not too good. So I uh, recommend just uh, going onto YouTube, typing in Arnold um, Showreel, and uh, it'll probably be one of the first things that pops up. So um, I'll hand you over to Jonathan now. Okay. Um, thanks for that, Dave. That's uh, that's great. I've been busily working away here, trying to uh, trying to make my presentation look as slick as yours. So <laughs> See, see if we can manage to do that. I'll just see if I can pass you my screen. Um, sorry about this. There we go. There we are. Okay. Lovely. Okay, so that should work. So hopefully you can see uh, see the screen. Now look. Um, Really, what I wanted to talk to you about today was um, was a little bit more about the the workflow that we use here at um, uh, here at uh, Your Creative Solutions um, and how we make use of a, a very traditional uh, design process um, uh, that's been used in the sort of theatre industry for hundreds of years uh, to uh, to enable us to deliver uh, products quickly and easily to uh, uh, to the modern day clients. Now, um, whoops, here we go. First of all, a little bit about um, uh, your creative solutions. We're a, a, a creative solutions company. Uh, we have three main areas uh, that we work in. The first is uh, design and visualization, which is what we'll be looking at today. Um, now, uh, that obviously involves a lot of work with 3ds Max, um, and we are a, a, a V-Ray user as well. Um, it also involves work uh, on uh, fly-throughs to a degree, um, in interactive panoramas, um, and a little bit of uh, VR work as well. Um, uh, then also, we also take to the next stage. Once we um, once we uh, come up with a design for our clients, we quite often find that they say, "Well, that's great. Thanks very much for that. But can you just get it get it made now?" So, uh, so we also have a project management service, and that fits in quite well with the uh, Autodesk products because um, once we've got the sort of nice pictures, uh, because they're all uh, scale models, it means that we can then uh, use the integration between Max and AutoCAD to produce the, uh, the construction drawings for the workshops, um, and also take it a stage further. Um, and um, as I'll, I'll try and flip through this quickly in a moment, uh, uh, we can also produce the cutting files for the machines in the workshops as well. Um, and we are also uh, also offer specialist scenic supplies, um, which we bring in from uh, from from Europe mainly, uh, just to add to the uh, the sort of the creativity of the uh, of the sets that we that both we we design and that also uh, our uh, our clients produce. Um, so as I said, um, the design process we use is based around the proven design process that's been used for hundreds of years, um, and. Uh, Really, that's, that has always uh, involved um, scale models. Now, as we all know, um, it's much easier for a client, uh, particularly somebody who's not a, a designer or not a visual person, uh, to get an idea of 
of the scale of um, and the, sort of the uh, of the environment that you're going to try and put them into uh, uh, with a with a model. Um, unfortunately, um, the days of having uh, many many weeks uh, or months even to produce these have have long gone. Certainly in the events in the corporate events industry, which is uh, the core of our work, and also the TV industry as well. To be honest, which we work in a lot. Um, so. Um, it seemed a natural progression to use um, uh, the, the th computer generated models for that. Now, um, again, this is just to, just to illustrate very quickly with the with the physical models. Um, obviously, you can email them around, so it was a bit of an iterative process. You would have um, a designer would would uh, have a, a briefing with the with the with the director or the producer, and would then go away and come back uh, some weeks later with them with their model. Um, they would then present that to the the production team who'd all all make their suggestions and contributions they'd go away and several months later you'd you'd find a finally hit the end result um so what we do is uh, exactly the same we produce uh, 3d models uh, uh almost exclusively using max um and those models are then turned in uh to uh, sort of, uh visualizations such as this one uh which are put forward to the clients um, we then, as I said before, we then take those a stage further. We produce the construction drawings, uh, some fairly simple ones, um, but also uh, cutting files for the CNC machines. Um, and of course, the great thing about uh, using uh, Max and the sort of quick, uh, the quick turnaround we can achieve with Max and V-Ray um, is that um, when the, if a client wants to change anything about the uh, about the event or the design, uh, we can do that very quickly and just uh, uh, regenerate the image. Um, I think this is just uh, an illustration of uh, uh, fly-throughs, which I uh, probably won't play too well um, over over a webinar, but that gives you a bit of an idea of uh, one of the projects we uh, we've previously run, um, and also um, the. Yeah, interactive panoramas as well. Uh, this is just a recording of a panorama for a, a event concept. Uh, it allows you to steer around in real time uh, and you can provide the hotspots on the screen so that you can then zoom into another environment or another another area, another room, whichever way you want it to be. And then we'll go back uh, back to our, our favourite newscaster there as well. So that was um, that was really a bit of a bit of the background. Now um, maybe the next thing to do would be if I if I manage to stop that, um, maybe we'll we'll just take you in instead to here we are into a bit of a, a real max environment now what i wanted to do today having given a basic idea of the of the pipeline was to just show a few of the techniques that we uh, that we use here in order to uh, get our models out of the door quickly uh, the general um, turnaround time uh, from the moment the phone rings is probably about five days and really that tends to be about a two and a half day turnaround um, to uh, to get the design brief uh, and then uh, generate the uh, generate the, the final images. Um, so anything we can do to speed up the process, uh, we obviously obviously will do. So this uh, this model that I've got in here, um, it's a it's a basic event model. It's just uh, something I I uh, created to try and illustrate uh, examples of what we do. You could call it a fashion show, um, which, whichever way you like. Now. Um, one of the things that I ought to point out is that we take the um, uh, our uh, sort of our team's um, production background, or as in theatre production background, uh, and use that to be able to actually um, produce a model that, as you can see from this, is set up basically as a as a stage would be in a, in a, in a in this case, in a um, it's actually the mobile convention center, so that's a, that's the, one of the main stages. Uh, but it could be in a, equally be in a ballroom or, or whatever. Um, so most of the modeling is done in a, a quite a basic way, but it's all um, important to say it's all done to scale. Um, so each uh, each element of it uh, can then uh, be moved across. Uh, as a very simple example, I could take. Uh, Take an element of that. It has to be a group, I remember. But if uh, if we take an element uh, of that, we could then export that. Uh, we can come here. We can say export. We can say export selected item only, and we can export that um, out into a DWG uh, file, uh, wherever DWG file. It is actually a. Um, it will send it through as a, a mesh because. Uh, of the, the sort of difference in the, the way that Max and, 
uh, and AutoCAD work, but it does give us a, a basic point to start with um, in, in uh, AutoCAD for our drawings and the cutting files. Um, so that's, uh, that's just one uh, little, little tidbit there. Um, now, that basic model, um, I, I guess I, what I should probably do is start to, to build it up and give you a bit more of an idea of, of how that works. But um, maybe, maybe, maybe if I come in here and just go to one of the, one of the views um, and we might, just, uh, we might just render that off. Maybe, we, maybe what I'll do is I'll show you what, what that's going to look like later on. I've got it running off on another machine, actually. So let's, um, let's jump into that. Here it is. It's the final scene just about to finish. Um, so we've got a few components in here, um, which are going to hopefully illustrate uh, some of the techniques we use. Um, the, the first thing I want to point out is that uh, there's a lot of repetition in the environments we produce. Uh, this venue has uh, about 5,000 seats, and although there's technically no reason for us to put every seat in, typically um, we will try and um, we will try and make the venue resemble um, the the real venue as much as we can because the client uh, has got the then got the flexibility to say, well, I want to see what it looks like from a different angle. It might show show uh, more of the more of that detail. Um, so um, as I say, 5,000 seats, that can have 5,000 items can slow, slow your uh, uh, rendering time down and your, and your uh, uh, viewport time uh, speed down. Uh, in this one, we've also got quite a number of uh, banquet tables, and each of those tables has got a, as you'll see later, it's got a little glass on it, uh, glasses on it, it's got cutlery and all the rest. So I want to show you techniques to use um, the uh, uh, V-Ray proxies uh, to make that uh, that achievable and the same technique was used for the trees at the back there as well so we'll have a, a quick flick through that um, I think the other thing I should uh, should show you it may be now that we've got a bit of the venue in there um, maybe the thing to show you next is about the lighting techniques uh, because um, I'm just going to drag another window across I've set something up in here um, it's just another instance of Max to try and illustrate it. Um, obviously, in, in Max, there are a number of uh, different ways of lighting a scene. And what we tend to find with uh, some, of the, um, some of the scenes that come to us um, from other, other suppliers is that they can look, uh, look very flat. And uh, again, we've borrowed techniques from, uh, from the theatre and TV sort of world. Um, and I thought I'd just try and illustrate that a little bit. So if I quickly come in here and uh, maybe just knock, knock those away, I was just set them up briefly earlier. Uh, so we've got our, our little man here, we've nicknamed him Dennis. Um, he's quite friendly, he appears in a lot of our, our events. He's gonna retire soon, I'm sure. Um, so um, one of the uh, ways we could come in here and, and light Dennis would be just with a, a regular uh, V-Ray light. And sure, that would that would work. That would all be, that would all be great. Uh, but you'll find that, however you want to do it, you'll find that if you go in there, I might just, um, just pop in and set the renderer up for you. So there are we. We're already there. That's good. Um, so if you uh, try and render old Dennis off there, we'll see, uh, we'll see where we're going to get to. Should be very quick in theory. Not going to be easy. There we are. Okay, so you can, that's not, it's not so bad, but from our point of view, um, we'd consider some of, uh, some of the, using that as a lighting technique to be quite a, quite a flat approach. Uh, and, um, and certainly once you've got a bigger scene using that sort of technique, um, you'll, you'll just, you'll have a, a bit of a mishmash of your, of your shadows and all the rest. So uh, the technique that we would always use, um, and again, just because we we borrowed it, um, is that uh, we would come in. We use uh, the V-Ray IES lights. Now, essentially, they are. Uh, you could you could just say that they're target spots. So if I whack a whack a spot in here, that's uh, that's all fine. Nothing particularly unusual about about that to start off with. Let's just go in here. Let me lose that. Um, but we. But the the main part of the technique is that we will uh, we will take that uh, that light and uh, let's move that across. 
And we'll take that light and we will we'll light in from a couple of angles at the front. Um, this is fairly typical, maybe it's a slightly, a slightly shallow angle, but it, it'll, it'll certainly illustrate the point. Um, now, by doing that, that will give us, um, as it is at the moment, that'll give us a fairly similar look to the uh, V-Rail um, plane light that we just had. But we're going to go in and we're going to change the IES file, which is the photometric file, and we're going to make we're going to make that uh, a specific theatre lighting type. Now these are um, these are they're just a bog standard, very easy to set up type of light that have been around for for years and years in in that that world. Um, and as we will see here, when we render it off, it'll probably be uh, probably be very bright, but we'll, we'll go and give it a go. Um, here we are. As you will see here, that will give you a much better um, sort of lighting setup. Now, I think what I might actually do on, on this is, I'm going to be a bit slow if I do it on this machine. But anyway, um, let's just try it. Let's try it. Let's see what we can do. I'll wait to come in. I'm going to kick into something I was going to talk about later, which is the uh, active shade, actually, in, uh, in V-Ray, uh, because it's this, this is exactly the sort of thing that it's going to be useful for. So, um, sorry to jump around a bit. Um, V-Ray Active Shade we use here a lot. Uh, it means that we can uh, run off pretty much real time um, the uh, the changes that we make, specifically with lighting and textures. Um, and um, it's, it's it's a very very fast, very good technique now. Um, to set it up properly, I'm just going to set a camera up as well. The um, again, the V-Ray physical, uh, the, the V-Ray now uses the uh, Max physical cameras, um, so we'll quickly jump in there and uh, create a create a camera. Uh, where are we? Here we go. So standard cameras, physical. Um, now again, I'm going to have my own little ways of setting this up. It, um, I'm sure everybody has their own approach, uh, but I'm just going to um, quickly set this up myself. Okay, and then we'll pop that camera in there. Now, there we go. All very, 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 very quick. We'll see the relevance of it later on. So there's uh, there's our Dennis, um, and we're all set up in here. So now, in th all I should need to do is hit uh, render here, and there we are. And I'll um, that'll come up in a moment. And that will uh, that'll then be a, a view of a view of Dennis that we can I'll put it right there. We are. So there's there's our there's our friend. Now um, one of the other good things about this is that while uh, while that uh, camera is still active in the V-Ray um, uh, Active Shade viewport, uh, I can just go up to a top view and it still updates that image. So I'm going to add a little bit of backlight into this just to give it a bit of depth. Um, my backlight make it a copy so I can adjust. The settings of that separately from the other two. I'll bring that forward. Let's bring that over there. A quick look. Yep, that's good. It's so that's again. It's an IES light. Um, it's the same type of light. Um, but I'm just going to. Um, it's going to come in here. I'm just going to two things. And the first one, I'm going to put it into a bit of a, a bit of a blue color just to fit in with our scene a little bit better. And I'm just these. Um, these values are pretty um, pretty representative of the actual fixture. These are, uh, give you an idea in the theatre world, these are a thousand, each, each of these lights is a thousand watts. So it's uh, pretty, pretty punchy. Um, I'm just gonna turn this down a little way. Uh, and then we should start to see it. You can see it up here. You can see it's the, a little bit of uh, blue on his shoulders, a little bit of backlight. A little bit of backlight will always give it a bit of, uh, a bit of more depth. Now, the reason I show you that is that we spend a lot of our time doing the uh, lighting within the scenes and the lighting on any any characters that we put in. So we don't just drop a drop a character in and say, "Well, that will give you the scale." We have to uh, light each one properly, and we light um, uh, sets in a similar way or, or elements on the set in a, a similar way. So that was just a, a quick a quick look through that. Um, 
the other thing I guess I should show you in here is that the uh, there's a V-Ray light lister, which is very similar to the um, uh, to the standard Max light lister. But it does mean that uh, up here I've got the uh, the two the two where are we two front lights that we had. Let's maybe move that out of the way. Um, two front lights there. Um, it, these are instances, so both of both of these appear in here, um, and I can then go in if I bring Dennis back just through the light lister. Um, I could go in and adjust the colour, give a slightly warmer light, and that will. Uh, here we are. I didn't really see that completely live, but that will uh, that will allow you to adjust the color tones as well. So we could just maybe check that back a little bit and that'll adjust through. Again, I'm not sure how well that shows up over the web, but it's, it's all these little things that add a little bit, little bit more realism. So that's a quick tour of the, um, of the lighting side. I'm very conscious of, of time. So let's, um, let's come out of that and go back into our, back into our main scene, which is here. Okay, so um, this, uh, uh, Okay, uh, where are we? If I go in here, I should be able to show you that the scene we created here, if I turn all the lights on, um, shift L, turn all the, all the lights in the scene on, you can see how many of those light setups we have just for this one scene. Um, these uh, V-Ray lights are up, up here, these are actually just to light the architecture side, um, but the, all of these are just uh, uh, for sort of scenic purposes. So um, let's move on very quickly from that. Uh, again, other ways to keep the scene efficient, I was um, talking about earlier. Um, obviously, let's go in um, and look. I told you that I had set up uh, some banquet tables. So I've just put them in as a group here. So if I jump in and unhide those, there's quite a number of tables in here. Now, if I, if I find one of those, and just isolate it for you so you can see it in a bit more detail. Uh, you'll see that that's a, a very, very low poly table. Um, however, um, the reason for that is, that, as you can see up here, it's a, it's a V-Ray proxy. So I thought maybe what we could do is jump back in to, uh, to our friend Dennis on the, other, on the other window. If I bring him back uh, and just very quickly uh, show you that um, this, this guy here is he's quite a. Let's maybe we'll stop that. He's quite a high um, high poly character. Um, so we go in here. There you go. So very high poly. Now, if I was to uh, uh, have a number of instances of, of these characters in a scene, then um, the the uh, scene will very quickly slow down, and that's certainly not what we want to do. But if I uh, if I convert him to a uh, to a mesh, we can editable mesh, um, then it immediately means that I can come in and I can uh, take that as a V-Ray mesh export. Now, um, I, I mean, I, I, I think this is a, a great, uh, a great technique. I'm just going to, uh, just going to go in onto my, uh, onto part of our server to, to save it. So apologies for that. So quickly jump through. Okay. So we're just going to save it in here, uh, save it into the uh, webinar files folder. That's just saying where the, where the proxy file is going to be saved. And the reason I'm saving it on the server is because uh, we uh, we do all our rendering through our render farm. So everything has to be um, stored on the server um, rather than on the local machine. Um, so I'm going to come in there, set that up. I'm just it's got a rather obscure name, but we're just going to we're just going to say it's uh, uh, Dennis. Um, and then I'm going to come down. I'm going to say automatically create the proxy. So it's going to turn this Dennis into a proxy. Um, and then I'm going to come down here and say the number of faces in the preview. I want that to be say 10% of the number of faces. Maybe we'll even make it 5%. Um, and let's hit OK on that. Immediately uh, we come in here and we have uh, reduced the poly count considerably. Obviously in the viewport. The character you have there, you couldn't use in the in the final render. But um, if I switch my um, active shade back on, so let's go to that camera view and hit render again. You see, there's absolutely no change whatsoever to the final rendered image um, of, of that character. And 
if I was to then go in uh, to our friend here, maybe uh, maybe take the lights with him as well, and I could I could repeat him any number of times, which will very quickly illustrate uh, by coming into uh, create an array. Maybe uh, maybe we'll just do it this way. Maybe we'll just say uh, we're working in millimeters here. Um, so we go put ten across that way. We might put um, might put ten across the other way. We might do that at 500 as well. I'll leave it as an instance, um, but I could do it as a copy to illustrate just how efficient it is. We'll leave it as an instance for now. So all those characters straight in there. Um, now what you do have, let's go back to the camera. Um, oh, wonderful. And of course go with the camera as well. Um, what you do have uh, is uh, multiple copies of the of the light. But it's going to accept that. Um, so to get around, we can go back into our um, into our lighting here. I might, I might just for the sake of argument, just just for speed, I might, I might just knock those out. There we are. So we've only got the backlight in there now. Uh, we'll go back in here. We'll say top because I've got the control uh, over the whole set of lights from the light lister, um, and I'm just going to come in. I'm going to pick pick one of those, and I'm going to I'm going to copy that, and because I copy it, it'll appear as a separate line on the light lister over here, um, and I'm going to turn that one on. So let's just turn one of those lights on, and you can see you immediately have that effect. So we have multiple copies, just an illustration of the uh, V-Ray proxy. Okay. So uh, enough of that. Again, a few minutes left. So let's jump uh, jump back into our other scene. Um, let's, I'll come out of that one. I don't want to do any more with that. Um, so we're going to. So where are we? Hmm. Yeah, okay. also typically of course they're all seen down. Never mind. It doesn't matter. We'll go back. We'll open that one up. That's all. Good. So uh, we'll just jump back in. Uh, yep. Um, so the next thing I was going to show you was how we um, how we use uh, XREF scenes in order to add in a, a whole of the environment without having to um, uh, slow, again slow the whole system down. So in this case, this is the uh, plenary at the Melbourne Convention Centre. Um, as you can see, there's a fair amount of detail in that. Uh, this is AutoCAD, it's in the CAD drawing. Uh, and we also have the uh, elevations. And we use the, uh, these elevations um, and, and uh, floor plans uh, along with photographic references to uh, build up that, that uh, model. It's uh, as low poly as we can get it, um, because the, although, the, uh, although it's important to see the environment, it's also really the sort of secondary element for us. So let's hope that I've got that. There we are. I've got that scene back up. Um, now, that's it. So um, what I've got in here um, I've, is the that entire um, that entire uh, venue. It's been modelled. I can view it from a number of different um, uh, angles. I might want to view it from the rear of the stalls. That's right at the very back. So you can see you've got some uh, sightline uh, issues there. Uh, I can view it from the far left or far right. Um, or which, whichever way we, we happen to have set that up. But um, again, just for illustrative purposes, let's go in, uh, where are we coming before? Um, let's go in here. Uh, if we if we go in this command X ref, there we are. And that gives you the X ref scene window. And you can see that what I've got in here um, is that scene which we've had uh, built up um, and we can uh, turn it on or off. Um, we can choose, for example, not to uh, bring in the lights that are built into the scene because you want to have more control over them, um, uh, which is the you know, way we, we often work. Um, now, um, I won't bother turning that on or off, but um, clearly you just uh, hit enable um, to bring it on and, and, and remove the teeth to disable it. Um, you can set it to automatically update. We tend not to, um, if, we work, if we've got one of our staff working on the, uh, on the actual scene, uh, in the actual environment and the other on the, on the set, uh, we would just um, keep, keep each other up to date and just hit update now and it'll bring in the latest version.
Um, now, one of the other things uh, to show you about this is that clearly, because it's an XREF, you can't select that. Um, so wherever we are, I'm selecting it there. It makes it much easier from my point of view to select different items on the set. Um, uh, we've also got a number of trees in, in here. Trees are notorious for sewing a scene down and people do tend to quite like them um, in, their, in, their, in their conference sets. At the moment it seems to be the flavour of the month so um, we do everything we can to reduce the, uh, the impact that's going to have on our modelling uh, modeling time. Um, so we've been through that, we've been through the cross extract scenes. Um, obviously we've uh, shown you very quickly a setup of the cameras and uh, in here you, you've seen that we've got a number of different um, camera positions set up. Um, specific use to us are the sight lines that we, we can check. So if a, if a client wants to say to us, well, uh, the, from the furthest uh, stage left position, which is always backwards, so uh, right over where my cursor is over here, can that person see the full set? Well, obviously we can go in there and say, well, they can see up to this point. And as long as we've got the sign off on that, uh, then believe me, they will check that in the venue. And uh, I think it's quite nice to get a phone call uh, from our staff to say, yep, that's all great. Um, they've, uh, they uh, they said it looked just like the sight lines that you, you provided. Um, so um, uh, then maybe if I, uh, if I quickly come in and show you, I did show you the active shape before. I was very keen to show you that. Uh, I just want to, uh, to illustrate again that it, it's uh, pretty pretty powerful. Um, I'm just going to change the scale on this. 640, 360, 640, 360 maybe. 640, 360. So there we are. This is 69 screen. Um, and that if we come in here, if we go to the advanced settings, we can include or otherwise. Um, uh, the uh, XRFs, extra XRF scenes, uh, we obviously want to include them, uh, and displacement and, and proxy objects. It's always important to make sure they're on if you want to get the full, uh, full image. And we also, because we've got the uh, render farm here, we also distribute the rendering. So I can tell you I've got two render nodes uh, that will be used as soon as I hit render. So it doesn't slow down my uh, viewport here. And again, it, slowing down the uh, the workstations is, is something we really want to avoid. So um, here we are. Let's, uh, let's bring that back across here. Uh, that's just uh, telling me that I've got um, in, invisible uh, V-ray lights uh, um, in, the, in that scene. But that's fine. We can lose those warnings just by zooming out and in theory. There we are. Um, so. So there we are. That scene is now uh, starting to render off. Um, maybe the uh, maybe the camera's not the not set up quite as well as we'd expect. But it, basically, um, I just wanted to illustrate that we can we can set up that um, that viewport. Now the other uh, the other oh here it is. It's coming back up now. So once it's um, it takes a few seconds for it to send the files off to the uh, render nodes that are processing it, and then and then it's uh, it's pretty good. It, keeping up to date with all the changes we might make. Um, so maybe maybe just to, just for ease, I'll stop that one up there for the moment. Um, and then I just wanted to show you one other thing, which is that, um, that um, oh, I suppose I should just, I'll just point out rather than anything else, uh, that we do use a lot of haze, as you can see, it's something starting to pop through in uh, even in the, um, uh, even the active shade view. Uh, we use quite a lot of haze, so we tend to set that up in the environment here. And we um, there's a number of um, sort of different options with this, but uh, more often than not, because of its realism, uh, we will use the uh, V-Ray environment fog. Um, it's act uh, set it up here. It's active. Um, you have a whole range of uh, settings here, which I won't go through because I know we're going to be quite short on time. Um, but one thing is that we we use tend to use the uh, uh, smoke uh, bitmap uh, out of uh, out of fit. right here we are just quickly going this is some of, this is the, um, the slate material editor so we tend to use um, the smoke which is available to us as a as a pattern for the environment map of course, in uh, my haste, I won't find it. Here we are. So there's our smoke. Uh, we tend to go in here, uh, and we do tend to adjust it down, actually. So uh, we might sort of go in. Oh, 
adjust it that's more like it um there we are so that'll be the basis of our uh, of, of our smoke and if we were to uh, provide a fly through of the scene then we can animate that smoke we can make it make it sort of ripple as well uh, which is uh, quite a nice look it gives a bit more depth um so um so that was uh, that was one thing i wanted to show you um and also that uh, they've uh, made a change uh, fairly recently, uh, which means that when you, um, it used to be a case that if you wanted to add uh, add lights um, to this, you, you can come in here and you can say you want to use all the lights, in which case it'll, it'll be a bit of just a fog, uh, but uh, they've changed it recently so you can uh, add lights uh, on mass. You used to be able to um, add them here, but you used to have to select each individual light, which worked fine if you only had four or five lights in your scene. But for us, as you saw earlier, uh, we have uh, we can have hundreds. Um, so now it's a case that you can select them in the um, um, in your um, um, you know, normally in max in whichever way you want to in your groups or, or whatever. Um, and um, then if you come in here, it just gives you an option um, to add all of those, which uh, which I did earlier in the pops more than nice and quickly. Um, by putting a, a box gizmo around as well, uh, that does speed things up because we can, we've got one box here that's uh, just over the stage area uh, and another box which is over, uh, the, over the catwalk um, uh, out here. Um, otherwise, you'd be, um, it, it would slow the rendering process down dramatically. Um, so that was uh, very quick on there, but I wanted to show you a deadline which we, uh, which we use. This is a think box product um, and again the reason I wanted to show you that is, is it just speeds things up for us uh, partly because as I said before uh, when you're in your active shade uh, active shade mode which we might just uh, kick off again just to, just to re-illustrate it um, let's go to this scene and, and just uh, and just run that through um, um, it uh, distributes um, it, well, a very distributes to that, but uh, but sorry, with with the uh, deadline, uh, I can submit a production render, um, and then over here I've got uh, a, if I can drag it through. It should look good. Here we are. I've got uh, full management here uh, of all the jobs that are running. Now uh, I, there we are. I've got a couple of jobs that are still running. Um, uh, for this uh, for this demonstration, um, I can see it's running on our uh, machine called CAD Crow's Nest, uh, which I can go and pick up over here, um, and I can I can see there we are that's that scene uh, running off now, and um, that's having no impact on the workstation, so the uh, the staff can carry on working and uh, and producing the scenes. There's another job there that's running uh, that's running on CAD Narrenburn. Uh, which is this one here. Uh, we've got a number of machines, uh, only two of them running at the moment. Um, but that's, um, that was something I thought was uh, important to show you. It's very easy to um, very easy to set up those jobs. Where are we? Uh, again, just really the, I think we're just doing a bit of a auto save here at the moment. There we are. Um, so, that job is running off in the uh, in the active shade, but if I stop that job uh, and then switch back into a production uh, production render here, then I very quickly go in and uh, my job is all set up and ready to go. I just change, quickly change the file name. Oh, let's make that um, uh, deadline demonstration. There we go. Uh, let's save that in with the other files. Uh, and all I have to do now, now that it's all set up on this side, um, I can come in here and I'm all set up and ready to set your priority. You can set it to um, uh, to tile the render so I can, if that was a slow scene to render, then I could break it down into um, a number of tiles, maybe 16 tiles, um, and it would render off across the whole render farm. And I can uh, just hit submit on that. Um, that takes a few moments to, to submit. Um, and then if I bring this, you can see that's green, that's submitted, it's all successful, and that will pop in at the top there. Looks like it might already have done so. Um, so that, uh, that job's now submitted in the queue, that'll run off and I'll get an email to say when that job's completed. Um, now that, uh, we find that that is a, a much more, um, much more reliable uh, distributed uh, sort of render management tool than, uh, than Backburner ever used to be. And to be honest, the maintenance that we do on that is is minimal, um, and the, the job success rate is is just 
it's just colossal. So um, I uh, I think that's uh, that's also also available through Digistore. Not that I'm necessarily trying to plug it, but uh, but that's uh, that's an option there. So um, I think probably um, uh, David and, and Mark. I don't know if I've covered enough there. I don't know if uh, if I've run way over time. Um, but uh, if you've uh, I don't know if you want to look at any questions or anything and I'll, and I'll just pull up the final render jobs that have uh, finished running while we've been whizzing through that. Uh, yeah, that's great. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, no one has typed in any questions so far, so we'll um, pause for a moment and see if anyone else has any questions for either David or Jonathan, just as a reminder, there is a Q&A um, button in your Zoom meeting, so um, click on that and you can type in your questions. Um, David, I don't know if you had any questions for Jonathan or any comments from that presentation. Um, maybe, Jonathan, if you could just elaborate um, why you use the, the smoke um, and hate mm. in your... Mm. Because yeah. um, yeah. I, I would imagine, you know, the, the live events probably aren't hazy. Or are they? Well, they they do they do tend to be, um, and uh, it's it's for a number of uh, number of reasons really. Um, they tend to be because just because of the environment, um, and, but they also it's also quite common for uh, haze to be added. It's an um, it's a, an extra sort of aesthetic on on the events. Um, it picks out the lighting and the event lighting, which is another reason why it's so important for us to use the IES files, because you see the beam shapes and sizes that the, that the lights uh, punch out. Um, and uh, any, uh, any big theater show or rock show or pop concert, um, there is a, a, lot of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of haze and smoke pumped out uh, that uh, lingers in the air. So, and, and to be honest, the, the, the lights that are used in that environment are so bright and powerful that they will pick up a, um, a produce a beam uh, a sort of haze like beam regardless uh, if you just imagine being outside with a, uh, the old-fashioned you know, the world war ii searchlights um, you can see the beam going you, know, you just see that in all the movies it's exactly the same principle the bright light with a very tightly focused beam um, you will you will see it it'll pick out so that's why we use it it also um, as well as as well as just recreating uh, the, the end result uh, it does tend to add quite a bit of depth as well to the scene and it's all about making it look as deep as possible there is um thanks jonathan there is a question from teddy who um, um typed that in which is what is the alternative to back burner you must have mentioned that during your presentation. Oh, oh deadline deadline is what it's a uh, deadlines product that's produced by thinkbox um and uh uh, it's a subscription product um, which Digital will be able to tell you all about. Um, it, you pay um, you pay a subscription per render node uh, per year, um, but for us that's a sort of relatively small uh, subscription. All right, so. Great. All right. Well, as there aren't any other questions um, coming up, I'll. Um, I'll just go back to my screen if that's okay, Jonathan, yeah, with yeah, some yeah. final contact details. Okay, um, so thank you very much for everybody um, attending. And um, I'd especially like to thank David and Jonathan for spending time with us today and for their illuminating present, uh, presentations. Thank you, guys. Oh, my pleasure. Um, I'm remember, yeah, remember to contact Digistore if we can help in any way to take advantage and um, also to take advantage of our V-Ray for 3D Studio Max special offer. If you have any questions about deadline and how it works, I think I understand today they released version 10 with um, substantial um, further integration with cloud rendering capabilities as well. So, um, so, something else about uh, deadline, which is quite important, I think, is that uh, it is the same render manager will work with a lot of other products. So you could submit After Effects jobs uh, into the uh, my understanding is After Effects jobs into the same uh, render manager if you wanted to. So if you're in a, an environment where you, where you use some of the Adobe products or 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 other or other other products that 
that have a, a rendering element of any sort, then you can feed those into the same queue um, and run them through the same render farm. Excellent. Okay, so um, thank you all once again for your attention and we absolutely looking forward to hearing from you again. We will send you a follow-up email in the coming days with um, our contact details so that you can get in touch with anything else that you need to know. But for now, um, thank you. I'll um, end the webinar.